All right. So maybe you just saw the new Gran Turismo movie and now you're inspired and want to become a sim racer. Or maybe you're just an avid car guy and you want to be able to do some racing at home. No matter what the reason is for getting into sim racing, there's definitely some things you got to know on the front side. So today I'm going to break down the top 10 things to know before you get into sim racing. So stick around. There's definitely a lot we got to cover. So we're going to dive right in with number 10, choosing between a console and a PC. Now, if sim racing were a drug, console racing would be like the gateway drug. PC racing would be like crack. No matter what you do, you're always going to want more when you get into sim racing. And you'll find that consoles can be a little bit limited. Maybe it's just that you want to be able to run triple screens or run any one of a number of add-ons that you can run on a PC or be able to use aftermarket shifters and handbrakes or build your own for that matter. With console gaming, you're basically limited to one screen, a very basic setup, and typically not necessarily the most simulated racing games out there. Now I will say this, if you've already got a console and you don't have a PC that can run racing simulators, then by all means, buy what you need to get started on the console just make sure it's stuff that's cross-compatible that can go over to PC later on. Build your rig and get started on the console. But if you have the means, it's important to note that you're almost guaranteed going to want to go PC in the long run. All right, so now that we've discussed whether to go PC or console, let's suppose you do go with the PC. The next question that gets asked a lot is, what kind of PC requirements are there to run iRacing, a set of Corsa, run triple screens, VR. And the fact is, I don't have all the answers for you guys. I can't give you a comprehensive list of this combination of processor and video card are going to do what you want them to do. What I can tell you is I started out racing with a Ryzen 5 3600 processor, a Radeon RX 580 video card. Now that video card is $129 right now. It does have the option to connect three display ports which I did do and ran triple monitors on it just fine at 100 plus frames per second. But I did have to have the graphics turned down pretty significantly. I've recently upgraded the video card and I can run higher graphics at a higher frame rate and all that stuff. But the point I'm getting at is I started with a very basic gaming setup. Even that basic setup could still run triple screens. If you have the option to plug in triple screens into your GPU, there's a pretty good chance you're going to be able to run the game. It's just a matter of what graphics you want. All right, guys. So now that we've decided between PC racing or console racing, we got to decide what games we're going to play. So there's three types of options you could choose between. You have your arcade games, your sim racing, and your simcade. Now, this might be a little bit controversial, but I'm going to break this down for you. So arcade games, something like Forza Horizon or Need for Speed kind of falls into the arcade racing scene. A simcade game would be something like Project Cars, Forza Motorsports, arguably Gran Turismo as well. I want to give Gran Turismo just a little more credit because they were kind of the ones that came up with the original simulator model. It may not have been that great back then, but technology wasn't that great back then. You kind of have to hand it to them for being like the progressive innovators in that in that field. That being said, it does still kind of fall into the Simcade realm because it's not nearly as realistic as some of the other games. And then, of course, you have your actual sim racing games like iRacing, Assetto Corsa, arguably Automobilista, and several other racing simulators now no matter which one of these you decide on it's completely okay the whole reason you get into racing is for your own enjoyment if forza horizon or one of the arcade games does it for you that's great you could really like blow your budget on a expensive rig just to play some games that'll never take advantage of all the hardware most of the arcade games are better off played with a controller anyways if you're on a console, for the most part outside of Assetto Corsa, you're pretty much limited to Simcade games for the most part. And it's still an enjoyable way to get started. I'll tell you guys, when I started out sim racing back several years ago, my first rig I built was for the PS4. 
I was doing Gran Turismo. Uh, I was doing Dirt Rally. And I had a blast on it. Like, it was a single monitor, but I built a rig, got a wheel stand, mounted it up, went and ripped the seat out of a Mazda. And man, I had a blast. And I couldn't wait to build another rig. So I built my second rig, and now I'm on my third. And it all started with playing Gran Turismo on PS4. So it's okay to get into racing that way. There's nothing wrong with it. All right, now we're moving on to number seven. This is really getting into the meat and potatoes, the stuff you guys actually want to know. Now, this one is choosing between ultra-wide, triple screens, or VR. This question comes up all day, every day, in all the forums. Everybody wants to know what's best. I've heard people say ultra-wides are the best. I've heard people say triple screens are the best. Me personally, I have a preference for triple screens. I like the wraparound effect. I run triple screens at... 130 degrees so that I'm basically like enclosed in my cockpit. I want a really realistic feel. I want to feel like the car is wrapped around me. I basically want to create a VR experience without wearing a really uncomfortable set of VR headset goggles. So that's basically what I've done. One complaint I have seen a lot from people that use VR is that it can get quite annoying wearing that headset for longer races. It's not something that's sustainable long term. I've also heard that, uh, you know, when you're racing and it gets hot, like my race room is pretty warm. I can't imagine having a headset on for any long length of time, face sweating up against it. So for me, VR is just not an option. Some people love it. Some people swear by it. And it really comes down to what you want from it. But you're going to get equal opinions on all three. So you really have to decide. Now, one thing I have seen that looks really cool, some people actually do run an super ultra wide, like a 49 inch with 27s on the side. Now that's almost a full windshield with side windows. That is pretty legit. I could see how that would be awesome. But one single wide or one single ultra wide doesn't really wrap around you. To me, it's just like the least immersive or it would be. But for some people, they still think it's better than running triple screens. So it really comes down to preference, and it's something you guys got to decide which one is best for you. Let's talk number six, which wheel to buy. There are tons and tons of wheel options out there now. But direct drive wheelbases have become the new standard, and there's not really any reason at all to be looking at anything less than a direct drive wheelbase anymore. They come in every single price range. If you're looking at Logitech's gear-driven wheels or Thrustmaster's belt-driven wheels, like none of those are going to provide the same level of feedback that a direct drive wheel will. And nowadays, you're not even spending any more money for a direct drive. I mean, Camus has a wheel for like 300 bucks that costs the same as Logitech. There's no reason to even mess with the, the G920s and the G29s anymore. Fanatec has a great direct drive wheel and they're running promos for like 400 bucks for a setup or 500 if you're playing on the PlayStation. Spend a little bit more money, you'll enjoy it a lot more, it'll feel more realistic and you won't be upgrading right away. All I'm saying is the choice of direct drive wheels really comes down to what you want and how much force you want it to have. But just make sure that when you choose a wheel, you're getting a direct drive wheel base because there's just no reason not to anymore. Okay, so you've chosen a wheel, but did you leave enough room in the budget for number five? This is your pedal set. And a lot of people think that the wheel is the most important part when you're first getting into sim racing. You think that the wheel is going to have the biggest impact. It has to have the most force feedback. You've got to have the best wheel you can, and then you skimp out on the pedals a little bit, right? Truth be told, your pedals have a bigger impact on how you handle on a track than your wheel ever will. You could get by with just a little bit of force feedback on your wheel, but if you have spongy pedals, you're going to be all over the place on the track. You're not going to have any consistency in your braking. You're not really going to know how much pressure to apply to the brake. Personally, no matter what rig you decide to go with, no matter what setup, I recommend getting a load cell pedal. Load cell pedals, rather than being based off of travel or based off of pressure, just like a real car, it feels more natural and you're able to get a more consistent speed around the track. So definitely be considerate of that when you're buying your setup. Leave enough room in the budget to get a proper set of pedals and try to get one with a load cell in it. Number four on the list, built versus bought. Do 
you build your rig or do you buy one that's already pre-built or a kit that you can put together? Now, I will tell you this. Most people that build rigs don't account for how much force you're going to need for a force feedback wheel like a direct drive or how much you're going to need for the pedals that are going to have a load cell on them that you're actually going to be applying some significant pressure to. So if you're going to build a rig, you have to make sure it's going to be sturdy enough to withstand the beating you're going to give it. The next part of that is you can get some really good deals on like some tube rigs and things like that off of Wayfair or Amazon. Now that we're going to the direct drive systems, these rigs are pretty flexible and they're not necessarily going to hold up to all the force you're going to put behind them. So I recommend staying away from those. In today's market and the way things are going, really some profile rigs have become fairly affordable in most areas. I'm not going to say everywhere because I know some people are challenged with pricing and availability in some countries and stuff like that. I totally get it. If you have the option to go with an aluminum profile rig, I highly recommend it. It's going to be the most sturdy. It's going to hold up the best. If you're here in America, I highly recommend Rig Metal. I've bought a couple rigs from them. Awesome company. Uh, the quality is great. They always come with extra parts. I've got other videos about their rigs. So definitely check that out. But ultimately, be conscious of what it is that you want to do with it. Know your goals and know what the limitations are going to be if you're going to build your own rig. For this next part, I thought we should actually jump in the rig so I can explain it. A lot of people ask how it is that we control base shakers, ambient lighting, uh, wind simulators, little lap timers and stuff like I have here. If you guys watched my video that I made last week, I did a full tour of how the, uh, how the rigs put together. The video before that, I talked about how I built the ambient lighting. But the fact of the matter is just about everything sim racing related that you want to add on to your rig if you're using PC is all controlled through software called SimHub. So as you'll see, I do have lighting in the car. And as I pull forward into the light here, you're going to see that my dash begins to light up a little bit. And it, like as I go through shadows, it's going to flicker. This is part of the ambient lighting that... SimHub detects what's happening on screen and determines whether to make the lighting brighter or darker. And it gives you a really cool effect when you're going through things like shadows, which you'll see right here. There we go. We got a little flash. And we're about to lose a lot of lighting right here. And that's what's cool. This is actually a cool track. Um, to show this off because it does have a lot of shadowing in it but anyways you'll also see the like i said there's a lap timer over here sim hub controls that if i had base shakers it would control that as well i have used them in the past we'll get to that in a second but ultimately if you're into sim racing and you're playing on pc or if you're getting into sim racing and you're going to play on pc you need to learn about SimHub. It's a free download. It is kind of limited in what you can do with it if you don't use the product key or it doesn't work as good if you don't use the product key. So I definitely recommend doing a $10 donation or whatever it takes to get the product key and make sure you have it just because it, it does. It, like, it makes sim racing a lot better and it's just kind of a must have if you're gonna get into sim racing. All right, now I said we'd get back to it. Let's talk about base shakers. That was number two on my list. So base shakers, tactiles, whatever you want to call them. Uh, there's a lot of different options out there now. It's kind of an expanding market. The most commonly used are either butt kicker or some Dayton pucks. There's a lot of different ways you can go about setting it up. Personally, my most experience with them, I did have on my last rig a uh, butt kicker gamer two. I thought it was fantastic, really. I mounted it directly onto the bottom of my seat. At the time, I had a, a wood bottom under at the very base of my seat. Peeled back everything, bolted a pole underneath, and tied on the butt kicker gamer, too. It was one of those things that I got used to having, and it got really hard to play without it. I love that thing, uh, and it's something I plan on adding back on. Problem is, I haven't exactly decided how I want to go about it, if I want to do four corners 
one thing you'll see a lot of people say in the forums, the most important thing is you get one by your seat and you get one on your pedals. The one on the pedals is good for analog brakes. The one on the seat just gives you that feedback of what's happening on the road. You could do the four corners where it adapts to each tire. You could do all four corners plus the seat and the pedals. It really comes down to how you want to do it. But ultimately, no matter what you're doing with base shakers, you're going to use Sim Hub. That's going to be the best way to dial it in and program it the way you want it to. The number one most important thing to know before getting into sim racing. Practice, practice, practice. You can't climb in the ring with all the because you think you box. Don't think that just because you've done good at some arcade racing game that you could jump into something like iRacing and just start racing on the track with other drivers on your first day. You might be really good. But if you haven't already practiced and you don't have some clean laps on that track under your belt, then don't even try. If you don't know the track really well, there's a good chance that you're going to struggle and ruin your, your ratings. And you could potentially ruin the race for other drivers. A lot of racers, myself included, spend a lot of time practicing before going out onto a track to race. We want to make sure that we're going to be safe around others. We want to make sure we're going to perform at our best. And if you can't get around the track safely without going off track or crashing into something, then that means you're not going to be able to do 20 laps on the track clean either. So get some practice in, get comfortable on the track, get yourself within a reasonable range of what the pace is. If you're within six or seven seconds, that's okay. You're probably going to be fine. You're going to start towards the back of the pack. Be conscious of blue flags if you're getting lapped. Be considerate of those who are racing at a much faster pace. You should be just fine. But don't jump into the track and just try to dive bomb every single corner. Smash through everybody. That's not how sim racing works. Like, it's taken a little bit more serious. So if it's not something you're used to, get familiar with the community. Get familiar with the practicing and the processes. And then start doing the races. All right, guys. So hopefully... That give you some insight into some things to consider when you get into sim racing. For those of you that follow the channel, I know I said that I was going to do a button box build this week. But this kind of seemed like a relevant thing to do right now. Being that so many new people are coming into sim racing. And I think there's going to be a really big influx with this whole thing with the uh, Gran Turismo movie. Which people are saying was actually decent. Haven't seen it yet, but... Um, Truth is, I grew up playing Gran Turismo before I ever got into sim racing. I started out sim racing on Gran Turismo. So, I think it's pretty dope. I'm, I'm excited for it, and I think it's cool that they made a movie about sim racing, even though technically we all refer to it as a arcade sim or simcade, whatever. Um, I still have a respect for Gran Turismo as an innovative game, and I think it's pretty cool. So, next week we'll do the button box build. And I'll start working on that in the next couple of days. So I'll see you guys next week.